Hello everyone, I'm Flick, you probably don't know me and for once that might be important. Rather than pick a video game to talk at length about and cover its story, offering as much insight and critique as I can manage, I thought it would only be fair to turn that same discerning eye to my own channel, looking at its history and the highs and lows it's experienced since I started it in July of 2008. Yep, the earliest days of YouTube, I am that old. I'll also include some history of my Twitch livestream channel here and there since it tangentially connects with the performance of my YouTube channel at several points in time. It's a common occurrence for new viewers who find my channel here on YouTube to assume the worst when seeing the high subscriber count relative to the very, very low average number of views any new upload receives. There was a time when my videos got hundreds of thousands of views per day and my most viewed video hit 12 million views just recently. My hope is that this little dissection will also be a good way to explain why this ratio is so off and bring you through the lifespan of a channel that's been around for nearing two decades and is, if you'll pardon the pun, flickering out. This is not a pity post or to garner sympathy, I'd like to make that very clear. This is for analysis and nothing more. I'm going to be as neutral as possible in discussing the things I did wrong that contributed to my channel failing, as well as any and all outside circumstances like the changing landscape of both YouTube and Twitch, along with anything else I feel influenced the outcome of things. I'll also speak on plans going forwards at the end of the video. If any of what I say later in the video sounds familiar to you, that's because it's lifted from a free-to-view Patreon post-mortem I wrote up about my channel in 2019. The feelings I had then were much rawer and than now, but I still believe them, so I've lifted some of what I'll be saying directly from there. Most of the footage in the video is just going to be some general gameplay and I might also include some videos from the relevant eras of my channel that I'm discussing so you aren't staring at a blank screen or the, the tiny blue man talking to you in the corner. Where possible, I'll try to provide some screen captures of relevant analytical data but not everything has a paper trail so I feel I should include a general warning that these are obviously my opinions unless otherwise stated or shown to be an absolute fact. With that all said, grab yourself something to drink, something to eat and we will begin. F. K. In the coffee. Let's start with a little background. This is really going to show how much of an old I am, but before YouTube existed and back in the days of VHS, my friend and I would record ourselves playing video games from my PS1 onto videotapes. No one would ever watch those tapes besides us, but we still did it. Not sure why, but I have very vivid memories of us recording matches of Vigilante 8 specifically. I can't really explain why that urge was there to play games for an audience, even imaginary audiences like it was back then, I can only illustrate that it is an urge that exists within people. It could just come down to the basic desire to show off something you value in return for validation. I created my gaming channel, the one you're seeing this video on right now, called Flick's Gaming Stuff These Days, or at Flick, on July 5th, 2008. But I was actually part of a YouTube channel prior to that, created on September 19th, 2006, named Gunsha Productions. Jesus, that was a long time ago. It still exists to this day, by the way, if you want to go see it. In the early days of YouTube, YouTube having opened its virtual doors just one year earlier on February 14th, 2005, if you aren't aware, we made comedy videos and skits about the MMORPG Final Fantasy XI, filmed within the game and starring my friend's character. My own character appeared in some of the episodes and I wrote all the scripts for the videos we made. They were a mix of actual guides on how to do things in the game, parodies of other video games, and some in-jokes that only players of Final Fantasy XI would get. We lasted a good couple of years, but personal differences split us apart eventually. I never had access to the channel itself, all I did was write the words, so I had very little to show for it once it was all over. YouTube wasn't monetized or anything back then though, so it wasn't that big of a deal. After Gunshot Productions split up and we went our separate ways, I started my own YouTube channel almost instantly. Originally it was called Flick FFXI because I really wanted to just keep on making Final Fantasy XI themed content. I was very addicted to that game. Although a few have been lost to time due to the music I used in them, you might still be able to find a couple if you go back to the very first uploads I put on this channel. Eventually I moved on from my addiction to Final Fantasy XI though, and it gave me a chance to branch out into the greater world of gaming, so let's look at that. F. K. 
in the coffee. I took a liking to video creation and showing off video games in general. These were the early days of YouTube when Let's Plays were a new concept and everyone was finding their feet content creation wise. I guess I can't speak for content outside of the gaming space, but clips, tutorials, playthroughs, Let's Plays all felt fresh back then because they were. I was actually one of the first people to start creating HD console video game coverage thanks to my Hapage HD PVR, one of the first bits of kit that made it possible to do so at 720p, released just a couple of months beforehand in May 2008. These videos I made back then were just for fun. It was unedited, let's play style stuff in the most basic possible generic sense. Watch me play this game if you want to, that sort of thing. YouTube still had a 10 minute limit on video length back then, but in around 2010 it rose to 15, and then by the end of that year I believe the limit was removed completely. I was working retail and on my evenings or days off I'd record myself playing video games and usually leave them uploading overnight while I slept, since the internet speeds in rural Scotland were so utterly terrible that's what I had to do. I really want to emphasise that because believe it or not it will matter later. I lived so rurally that broadband didn't roll out until much later than the rest of the UK and the UK was already way behind everyone else by that point. In those early videos I wouldn't even speak. I was very self-conscious that despite not having a particularly strong accent, my Scottish accent having been diluted by having English friends as a young child, people would struggle to understand me. It was probably unfounded, it isn't like we're the hardest people to understand, although we Scottish do tend to talk quickly and slur our words together, I catch myself doing that sometimes, so it might have been a problem. It was either videos of Minecraft or DC Universe Online, I think, where I first started speaking on camera with my friends using cheap headset mics with no pop filters. I wouldn't recommend going to go look for those. By choosing not to speak in early videos, it certainly hurt my efforts in making a name for myself despite starting so early. I didn't care about it back then, just to be clear, it was literally just for fun and YouTube wouldn't be monetized for years yet, but this is hindsight speaking. Today, commentary list playthroughs of video games are actually making a bit of a comeback on YouTube. There's certainly people who prefer them to having someone blather over the game they're trying to watch. When I gave up on playing God of War Ragnarok, which I did a little video about if you're curious, it was a single video of the game's story with absolutely no commentary that I sought out to watch. Back then everything was new and no one had any idea what they were doing, that's the important part. It was a digital wild west trying to work out its identity on multiple levels. What purpose did YouTube serve? What would you want to use YouTube for? What could you use YouTube for? What laws applied? What, what was copyright? What was fair use? What do you mean putting no copyright infringement intended in the video featuring copyrighted material isn't a defence? Those who were shrewd enough to develop an online persona back then certainly showed a level of foresight that I would never be able to match, but that's a story we can touch on a bit later. Let's skip a few years of just uploading Let's Plays for fun and get to the proper meaty stuff. F. K. In the coffee. Sometime around mid to late 2010 I think it was, and I'm having to guess dates here because the site no longer exists, I became a writer for the gaming website criticalgamer.co.uk, doing reviews, news, opinion pieces, that kind of thing. Some of the things I wrote even made it into print as part of a free supplement in a UK newspaper. I was still working retail at the time, so it very much remained a, a side gig, but it was a nice taste of the journalistic side of the gaming industry that I was very interested in getting into. It was being a part of Critical Gamer's writing staff that I learned about how publishers handle review sites, the various stipulations you would sometimes get that differ wildly from one publisher to the next, and the expectations of getting all your thoughts into exactly 1000 words or less. Thankfully in this video essay format I can be as overly verbose as I desire, HA! Take that Luke. Luke is my former editor. When I applied for a position on the Critical Gamer staff I used the fact that I had won a review contest sometime in late 2009 to give myself a bit more credibility. Besides just having a general love for video games and talking about them, I had no professional experience in the area at all. An online gaming retailer ran a contest for best review, and I don't really remember the specifics of their judging criteria and I don't think they were even revealed, 
but my review of Batman Arkham Asylum won me first place. I could probably do that game more justice today, and who knows, maybe I will in the future. How this all links back to YouTube will become apparent soon, trust me. I was still doing YouTube in my spare time, let's plays of whatever game took my fancy between my actual work and then also doing gaming writing for Critical Gamer. It was via some of the opinion pieces I'd wrote for the site that I got my first taste of butting heads with opposing views on gaming. They say I wasn't ready for the level of vitriol people free from consequence thanks to the anonymity of the internet could throw at you would be a massive, massive understatement. Somewhere along the line, I think my editor grasped onto some of my opinions about gaming being in the minority and enjoyed the traffic it brought to the site when shared on news gathering platforms. I didn't like Steam, still don't, but it's the best we've got in a sea of shit. I didn't like Dark Souls 1, although after the travesty that was Dark Souls 3, I respect it a lot more now. And to this day, I still despise Metal Gear Solid 3. I remember chatting to my editor on occasions and he'd say, okay, here's so-and-so a game for you to review. And I'd look at it and say, this really isn't the type of game I enjoy. Are you sure you want me to do this? And of course he did. It helped grow the site and get more traffic, but also subjected me to the worst stereotypes of gamer rage. How dare you not like the toy I formed my entire personality around for some reason. Yeah, I know arguments aren't a new concept, nor are just general disagreements, but the anonymous internet rage I would sometimes get was unsettling compared to how these kind of things play out in real life. Two adults having a disagreement about a subject face to face is very different to two people hiding behind screen names online. I'm not sure what about games it is that creates such strong grandstanding in people, but if someone finds out you don't like Dark Souls 1, it's like a floodgate of hate opens. Shut your fucking mouth! No problem, Charles. Shut the fuck up, you cunt! Shut it! The reason I'm mentioning this is that it set me up badly for things to come later down the line. I wasn't terminally online reading takes. I played MMOs, sure, but I didn't go around forums arguing with people. Twitter and Facebook weren't the monsters they would later become, and I didn't use Reddit until about 2015. Hell, I didn't even know what Reddit was until 2011 when a guy I was seeing was staying over and he looked at it on my PC. I had to ask him what it was like I was internet illiterate. I wasn't ready for people who waste away their days arguing with each other on sites like that. I had no idea that was how people behaved online. I got a taste of what at the time I thought was the worst of the internet and that was enough to make me not really want to interact online, but that was still just drops in the ocean compared to a few years later when something as simple as my opinion on a video game's balance would lead to someone threatening my life. Boy. That escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. F. K. In the coffee. Through my work at Critical Gamer, I received review copies of games. Sometimes it was as simple as an Xbox Arcade code. Most of the time, though, it was a physical review copy that had to be mailed out to me by my editor. Not every publisher handles things the same way, and I'm sure you've heard about, um, hmm, let's see, picky? Some are, with who is and is not allowed to review copies of their games. Back then, things were a little more lax. I only remember Nintendo being near impossible to even communicate with. There were sometimes stipulations on what could and could not be talked about prior to certain dates, but a lot of the time, a general embargo is agreed upon for when reviews or previews could go live. This was the era before paid for previews and IGN exclusives, if you aren't aware. Sometimes there wouldn't even be an embargo and this is what led to the first bump in popularity my little Let's Play YouTube channel would get. Late in 2010, Bandai Namco released Dragon Ball Z Raging Blast 2. I think I was the only anime fan on staff, so I was given the review copy to cover for Critical Gamers Review. When the review copy arrived, it had no embargo information at all. I got in touch with my editor to double check with their contact at Bandai Namco uh, to see whether or not there was any kind of embargo. There was not. And so I recorded some gameplay footage to embed on the page for my review and because Critical Gamer didn't have a YouTube channel, I just used my own. Now if I were to do this today, I think, even without a definitive embargo, if you upload gameplay of something not out for a few weeks, you'll end up with a manually issued DMCA takedown. But back in 2010, it was a completely different time. 
I was just reading today about a non-press streamer who got an advanced copy of Dragon's Dogma 2 about a week or so early and tried streaming it on Twitch. He was nuked from orbit within two hours. I remember something similar happening to someone who got Fallout 4 early back in the day. Back in 2010 though, I was uploading gameplay of a game not out for weeks. Simple little matches to show off the gameplay a little and they picked up traction. I remember being at my job and looking at my phone during the shift and going to my channel and seeing a video I'd made go live overnight hit a few thousand views when normally I'd be lucky if a couple of hundred is how much it would get. At the end of my shift I checked the same video again and the views had doubled. Although it wasn't uploaded until after the game was out, to date the most viewed video on my channel is one of the Raging Blast 2 videos I uploaded back then. On November 9th 2010 I published Dragon Ball Z Raging Blast 2 Goku and Vegeta vs Movie Villains and that video recently passed 12 million total views. In fact, in the top 20 most viewed videos on my channel, there's at least 6 Raging Blast 2 videos with over half a million views each. This boosted my subscribers and over the years until relatively recently remained evergreen, a constant source of new views and subscribers because the algorithm took a liking to these high performing videos and offered them to a lot of people. It didn't stop there, alongside Raging Blast 2 I'd actually already been covering Naruto Ninja Storm 2 for Critical Gamer which released back in October 2010 also from Bandai Namco. And videos of me getting the best possible rank in each of those high spectacle story battles from those games started getting a lot more views as well. The success of videos about both these anime games drew in the anime lovers from two different massive fandoms and they started to grow my channel very quickly. Was this a good thing? Well, I liked watching the numbers go up, sure, but I wasn't earning anything from it and I wasn't the reason. I didn't speak in any of the videos, it was just gameplay and besides answering comments or taking requests for certain matchups to record, there wasn't really any of me in there, it was just the game I was covering for the site I wrote for. And while I did go on to cover many more anime games, since I enjoyed them, even after Critical Gamer closed down, they never quite hit the same as Raging Blast 2 or Ninja Storm 2. During this explosion in popularity of anime game videos on my channel, people had started making money on YouTube, so let's talk about that. F. K. In the coffee. Being as young and, yeah, stupid as I was back then, when I heard that YouTubers could make money via joining a multi-channel network, or MCN for short, I scoffed at it. I had a real job. I had a fake job already too, writing for Critical Gamer. YouTube was just something I did for fun and I looked down my nose at anyone trying to make money from gaming videos. Game journalism was where those with integrity went. Are you serious? Yeah, I was that stupid. I actually believed that at the time though. The point is, I didn't even pursue the option of monetization back then until, huh, well this is going to take some explaining. Bringo Hurty is the name of a gaming podcast a friend and I created. I think some of the old episodes are actually still on this channel and might still be on iTunes. I just showed up and chatted with my terrible mic. It was my friend who handled the back end and decided what content would stay in, what would end up on the cutting room floor, etc. I'll spare you the details of why we called it that, we'd talk about gaming related things like new releases, gaming news, the like. I remember we'd do this thing where we'd both play a demo of a new game and then review what we thought to each other live while recording. Anyway, the subject of making money on YouTube and MCNs in general came up. I don't remember if it was because I'd been approached by an MCN, thanks to the growth my channel had experienced from the anime game coverage, or if this was just something making waves on the internet in general. Either way, my friend egged me on. Why not do it, he'd say. What's the worst that could happen? Fuck. Now here's where I have to be honest with you. I don't like watching ads. And I'd like to remind you that this was many years ago, so adblock was not a thing. So I struggled with having them on my videos and somewhat out of my control since the MCN would handle the back end. Eventually I capitulated though and joined Curse Network, an MCN that at the time had a very good reputation. I stayed with them for a good while until they went bust and got bought out by Polaris, but that's another story. Since they handled the back end of your channel, monetization wise I had no idea what it would mean, but it was during the recording of one of our podcast episodes that I received my first ever paycheck from Curse. 
The paycheck was for £3,300, more money than I'd ever had in my bank account. YouTube takes 55% of ad revenue and Curse was taking 30% of the 45% I was getting and it was still that much. I couldn't believe it. It was so much more than I was earning at my actual job. Although the number did drop a little in future months, my channel kept growing to the point where eventually I quit my job to focus on YouTube because it was the logical decision. It was making so much more money and my job was horrible. So things for a while looked pretty damn good. F. K. In the coffee. You know, I always thought of my YouTube channel like a TV station. A lot of variety, something for everyone, letting you pick and choose what shows you wanted to watch and ignore the ones that you didn't. With severe levels of hindsight, that was probably a mistake. But I can't deny that variety still appeals to me even to this day. With any success of one specific game, it meant I had to play a lot of it, and I knew deep down it would get to the point where I wouldn't want to anymore. Was there an arrogant thought in there, something like, if I did stop playing it, people would still stick around anyway because I'm such a good content creator? I want to say there wasn't, but I'm honestly not sure. Anime games were still something I featured on the channel since I enjoyed playing them, but I also played, well, a bunch of stuff, really. No specific genre, no specific format. I know that this isn't very descriptive, but I don't have any particular allegiance to any one type of game or console or anything like that. I wanted variety and I brought that to the channel, which was mistake number two, actually. While some of my anime videos remained evergreen, in general views went down and new subscribers slowed pretty harshly. Nothing new I was doing ever since matched the success of late 2010 into 2011. There was nothing in the style of Let's Plays I was doing that I could really say, yes, this is the unique thing that makes me stand out of the crowd. Unless you kept my voice, I suppose, since I'd started speaking in my videos by then. Lost in a sea of similar channels doing the same, similar things, I was, prior to establishing myself as a voice in the crowd, was the first real mistake of the many mistakes I made. Things plodded along though, and after a while, there was a small amount of success found with my coverage of the Monster Hunter series. On the back of the anime video success, my channel was still pulling in large enough viewership that I got a sponsorship deal with Capcom to make two videos with fellow YouTuber Dodger about Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. Those videos are still on the channel if you're curious, at the start of the playlist for the game. The Monster Hunter sponsorship introduced me to a series of video games that I fell in love with and helped me make new friends that I have to this day, so I'll be eternally grateful for that sponsorship. With my rural internet being so terrible, I wasn't able to stream until Twitch was fully established as the next big thing. It wasn't so much that I was late to the ship, I got there years after the ship had already sank. I did try to stream with my one megabyte upload speed on YouTube around 2013, but that was just awful, it didn't work. It wasn't until March 2016, three whole years later, that I was finally able to start a Twitch channel. My very first stream had around 11 viewers and was of Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate on the Wii U. From the friends I made playing Monster Hunter, we started playing other online games. Things plodded along and I was getting by despite earning much less. And then, a little game called Overwatch happened. F. K. In the coffee. So I had been streaming to less than 20 people for a while, just mucking around with friends, playing co-op games, and along came an open beta for Overwatch, the new game from Blizzard. The hype was real for some of my friends, but I'd never heard of it. But they made it sound good, so I decided to give it a try. I had no idea it would lead to both so many good things and so many bad things happening. When the full release of Overwatch happened, we had fun with the game. I know, it's crazy. In particular, videos of us all playing as the same hero, such as a team consisting of six Torbjorn or six Reinhardt, and pulling out a win while pissing ourselves laughing picked up a lot of traction when the VODs of the matches made it from Twitch over to YouTube. This created this amazing feedback loop. The YouTube videos got views, which brought more people to the Twitch stream, where we were then encouraged to do dumb shit in the game that became highlights that got put onto YouTube, and it became this big cycle just constantly repeating. Viewership on YouTube exploded, at its best being in the hundreds of thousands of views per day across the channel. On the streaming side, viewership was usually in the high hundreds, and on one occasion over a thousand thanks to some front page promotion. I was accepted into the Twitch partner program within two months of becoming a streamer 
thanks to Overwatch alone and began earning money from streaming, which was the only way you could do it back then other than direct donation. But that paled in comparison to how the YouTube channel was doing. My best month in earnings on just YouTube was almost £10,000, compared to approximately £200 now for comparison. Quite the drop to, uh, state the obvious. Oof. One of my fondest memories from that time was telling my mother how much I made in that best month and her grabbing my arm to keep her balance from the shock. She couldn't believe it and neither could I. I've never experienced that level of success ever again. It came not too long after my grandmother had passed away from cancer and it eats away at me that she wasn't around to see it too since I always felt she worried about my future. I think one of my biggest flaws is that I rest on my laurels. That means that I'm satisfied with my achievements and don't really make an effort to do anything else if it's working. My Overwatch content was a success, ergo I kept making it and everything was fine. I still played other stuff, despite them not having the same draw, because who cares, the Overwatch videos are doing fine. I wouldn't necessarily have been any happier about things back then if I had lent more heavily into the success I was experiencing with Overwatch, but the success would have lasted longer for sure. You know, before Overwatch, I remember staying on video more than once, probably while playing Binding of Isaac. I wish people would just give me a chance, by which I meant if I could get the chance to present myself and my content in front of a large audience, enough of them would like it enough to stick around. Overwatch being so successful for me really hit home how wrong I was about that. The precise moment I noticed the disconnect between who people thought I was and who I actually am is burned into my memory. I remember glancing at stream during a, a Twitch stream of Overwatch where I won a one-on-one -on -one fight that I absolutely should have lost. I was playing as Mercy, I was cut off from my team, I got cornered by a Tracer, but I beat them. I was pleased with myself, not going to deny that, even if luck played a big part, and I wanted to see how the viewers reacted to that moment happening. I looked over at chat. How did he manage to win that? One person asked. It's Flick, came the near instant reply. I had no idea who either of these people were, and neither of them really knew me. They knew the persona they assigned to me, even if I didn't mean to present one. The real me silently thought to myself, wow that was damn lucky I won that, I bet chat loved it though. I remember that moment so vividly because it felt so strange, how I thought I presented myself and how I was perceived were so very different from each other. With the fame that Overwatch gave me, I was opened up to the wider world of people. Thousands of personalities, the good and bad apples, watching me live or in the comments on YouTube videos, I did not do well with a lot of that. Like I mentioned, I still played other games despite everyone wanting more and more Overwatch. Eventually we ran out of funny things to do though, so we were just playing the game normally and none of us were especially good at it. Egos got bruised, people got bored, tempers got frayed. Eventually my interest in Overwatch started to fade too and this process was expedited by some horrible experiences. Jeez, I'm not even sure where to start, but when you go from maybe a dozen comments a month to literally hundreds per day, it can be quite overwhelming, especially when there is some real unhinged crazy people out there and you normally make it an effort to reply to everyone. I'm not talking about trolls, by the way, or people who mocked my ability to play the game. I'm talking about the genuinely really disturbed individuals. One commenter told my friend he was a terrible father because his child was being cared for by his wife in the background while he played Overwatch with me. That kind of crazy. I once made a joke about McCree, I, I don't remember what they changed his name to in Overwatch 2 offhand, sorry, cowboy, cowboy man, being the sort of guy to do anything to anything and someone went on a rage fueled rant in the comments of that VOD about how homophobic I was. Granted, they kind of know I'm gay because I don't really talk about it, but Jesus, when you get to the point where a gay person can be homophobic, something has gone seriously fucking wrong. That brings us to the worst case that I mentioned briefly earlier, someone threatening my life, albeit indirectly. Now, I'll be clear, it was just an internet blowhard, the kind that's a coward in real life and makes up for it by desperately projecting fake machismo online. I wasn't in any real danger. It still wasn't a nice thing to see or hear, and does require a bit of explanation. So, there was a trend where people I banned from my livestream chat for this reason or that would gravitate towards the friends I played Overwatch with, since they were streaming it as well. 
it was a way to indirectly stay in the community without being in my chat in particular. A community where the common factor, or one of the common factors at least, is that I banned them made it inevitable that their hatred for me would become a cornerstone of their communal interest. In general, the things they'd say about me was school ground level garbage, but on one occasion I happened to be watching my friend play Overwatch while I wasn't streaming and I saw the threat being made against me. It started with, if I ever met Flick face to face, I wouldn't be held responsible for my actions. Something along those lines. You might be wondering, what did I do to this person for them to hate me so much? Well, as far as I can tell, it was a mixture between me banning them for shit talking and them having differing opinions to mine regarding which characters in Overwatch needed adjusting. Yeah, as simple as that. And it wasn't a one-off thing, my name became the Voldemort of that chat. Anytime it was so much as mentioned in passing, did this sad little man come crawling out of the shadows to talk about how much he hated me and the glee he would feel inflicting pain upon me. That was the only person who ever implied repeated violence. The rest of the vitriol was just a general consensus that I was bad and that they hated me. While also ironically accusing me of being hatred incarnate. Flick hates so and so, one would say. To which the other replied, Flick just hates. Utterly unaware of the irony of their actions. And this continued for some time. That said, those didn't bother me as much and certainly weren't as unsettling as the threat of, albeit impotent, violence. The biggest takeaway from those streams I'd watched though were how disappointed I was in someone I thought had my back. The person streaming, my friend. I'd streamed with them for a long time and, and here he was, silent, as his chat badmouthed and threatened me. I expected him to at least say, hey that's rude to talk about my friend like that, don't do that shit here, as I'd done in my chat, or in comments on YouTube videos when people attacked him. He had a polarising voice, let's say. But no, only silence. Silence that implied, at worst, agreement, or at best, a lack of interest in defending me. After that, and up until this day, I've never watched anyone I know stream as a result of that experience. It became more than obvious to me I could not cope with certain aspects of a certain level of fame, chief among them the unfettered, unstable hatred. F. K. In the coffee. So where do we begin with this? I am a private person. I love that things I create get attention, but as far as myself, I'd prefer to stay back. This shift to putting my writing skills to work into video essay format is a bigger step than it might appear to some of you. It's exposing my opinions and views to a potentially large audience once again for the first time since, well, let's call them the Overwatch years. Pessimism was always a problem for me, glass half empty, that kind of thing. If you see something important to you failing, it's bound to negatively affect your ability to be funny, to entertain, to stay calm, and everything else that's pretty important in this line of work. Over lockdown, severe anxiety issues returned that further compounded the growing issues affecting my ability to do my job well. Be it in my videos or my streams, I've never played a part. I have always, for better or worse, presented myself to my viewers. It's a difficult thing to do sometimes, given that in general I dislike attention and prefer to keep myself private. The only difference between online me and offline me is that I talk a lot more in streams. You don't just get the good stuff when you do that, though. That's the thing, especially with streaming. My foibles being on display to a large audience really should have clued me into the role you play in this industry. The part that you need to play, but it didn't. Why not? I felt playing a part seemed like a betrayal of the beliefs I had when I started doing this. For better or worse, I wanted to just be me. I don't want this to sound like I'm saying you must always put on a happy face. When I look back at issues people had with me, they are perfectly understandable. I enjoy offering up critique. I enjoy complaining. I enjoy poking fun. I enjoy being the stereotypical dour Scotsman. These things, especially done too much, can absolutely turn people off. One of the primary reasons people watch content creators is to escape life's woes, not to hear more about them. and hear them complain about some inane nonsense that they'd rather forget about as well. Before we move on, back in the Overwatch days, someone, just as a friendly jab, not anything mean-spirited, once made a compilation of me using the word pointless too much during videos. Here's a sampling of it. Which is about pointless. Basically pointless. You already had the flank, so that was a pointless move. Oh, you can also have pointless. Everything you did was pointless, so there's E3's pointless now. <laughs> but the... Why is it pointless now? 
What a pointless room. Then this really is pointless. Range up is pointless. Sacrifice rooms to me are really pointless. Little pointless exercise. It's pointless trying to do that. would be pointless. Pointless endeavor, but it's absolutely pointless for it's pointless. No deaths would have been pointless. Which is pointless because again, pretty pointless. Rather pointlessly and some totally pointless. It would have been pointless but true. This room seems pointless. A pointless thing. And far less pointlessly funny. The room is pointless from what I recall. It's kind of pointless. It seems a bit pointless. Be pointless. And the pointlessness of existence. Well, technically not pointless. Fairly pointless. Absolutely pointless. Bullshit. It's kind of pointless because probably pointlessly pointless. But pointless. It's made me pointless. Pointless endeavor, really. Yeah, they like doing rooms that are literally pointless. And it's pointless. That was pointless. This room seems pointless. So it seems like a pointless. An entirely pointless room. That pointless. Pointlessly. Pointless. Yeah, pointlessly. It seems pointless. How but do you understand why it's pointless? The pointlessness. Even more pointless. It's the pointlessness. Oh, it's pointless. This is rather pointless. So this is pointless. General is pointless. So it's pointless. You found that are pointless. And that was another pointless room. That was entirely pointless. But maybe losing health pointlessly. That seems rather pointless. Life, love, and the pointlessness of existence. Partially pointless. They're pointless. But it seems pointless. And it would be pointless. Have that was pointless. That would be pointless. Pointless. Their, their story, pointless. Absolutely pointless. But it's utterly pointless. So, well, that was pointless. Skittle suit is pointless. Paris Lockstone is pointless. It's utterly pointless. I already have one of those, so that's pointless. But Another bad habit of mine is that I often pick up on people's speaking habits. Overused words, mispronounced words, that kind of thing. You know, kind of like how Gordon Ramsay can't say dilapidated. He says dilapidated. That's bad, but the only thing worse is when I spot myself doing one of those things and... To this day, I still probably say pointless too much. That was just a gentle bit of ribbing. As I said, it wasn't mean-spirited. There's two ways to really annoy me though. Waste my time or betray my trust. And I experienced both of those things more than a few times during the tail end of the Overwatch years. But I also, unfortunately, discovered a third thing that really pushes my buttons. No, it wasn't backseating, although, well, okay, yes, fine, backseating is bloody annoying to most people, including me, sure, but it's relatively inane and easy to control with good moderation. The new button pusher I found was to be disproportionately insulted due to an insignificant comment or action, something which happens easier the larger the audience you have. Try to think of it like this. If one person in ten irrationally doesn't like you, it doesn't feel so bad, right? Yet a hundred out of a thousand, despite being the same ratio, feels much worse. Now go to a thousand out of ten thousand and keep going to account for videos that get a quarter of a million views or more. Sometimes people just flat out don't like each other, but when you stream or make a video, it's one versus a legion. To have an offhand joke about a video game character carefully examined for something to be offended about, such as one time I made fun of emo clothes on a character, or to hear genuine hate levied at me for an equally offhand complaint about a video game was something I had never experienced to such a degree. It was something different to trolling. That's easy to spot and ignore in most cases. This was genuine seething hatred. From my time with Critical Gamer, I was used to negative comments from those with different opinions about video game related topics, but the thing I probably still to this day cannot process is the raging heightened levels of hatred it could evoke. It isn't even always hate, it's hard to categorise, but I'd compare it to forms of insanity. Yeah, that's what it is, it's pure crazy. Here's an example. When I got my new dog and discovered she had worms as a young puppy, someone replied to my tweet talking about it, saying, Oh, that's a shame, I know someone who had a puppy that had worms and it died. Was... Was that a reply that's meant to be helpful? Comforting? What the fuck? There was more too. Never when I started making videos did I think I'd have to deal with something as serious as complaints from some of my female viewers about how a male moderator was conducting themselves with them in private. Or having a guest on that says something stupidly racist out of nowhere suddenly. For someone who already has a hard time understanding irrational emotions and actions, this was something I just did not know how to handle. Being able to handle negative or irrational people, even as extreme as this, is part and parcel of being in the public eye. I just wasn't ready for it. I wanted to understand it and not being able to do that just made the frustration worse. People will form an opinion on you and that opinion is not always going to be accurate and they will not be dissuaded from their conclusions no matter what you say or do. Those people that hate me because of differing opinions on Overwatch of all things will forever think of me as something worthy of hate. It's something beyond childish but it was a while ago now and it felt good to get it off my chest talking about it. Speaking of that, around 2019 was the year where I tried to be less uptight and private about myself as a person. 
if I'm inherently unlikable or hearing about mental health issues is uncomfortable, then this was obviously a mistake, since lockdown was especially tough for me and would have made things worse, but some good came of it. I would never have dreamt back in the Overwatch days or long before that of openly playing a game on stream where I can marry a man, for instance. That would cross a line between my private and public life that I would not want attention drawn to all those years ago. It began to set in though that my brand, which I hate referring to myself as by the way, isn't something that most people want or that has any form of value. The bumps of success along the lifetime of my YouTube channel have very little to do with me and everything to do with luck. Never once did I select a game I became known for because I suspected it would have this effect, it just happened thanks to luck. Right place, right time, there really isn't anything else to it. I'd love to pretend that dealing with hateful, self-righteous people was a skill I've now developed over the years I've been exposed to it, but I'm no better at it today than when I started. When Overwatch 2 came out, I ended up playing it a little, I actually took the time to get a little better at it by watching world-class players for tips and tricks. I lost some more regulars and semi-regular viewers who decided to set fire to a few bridges on the way out because I dared say someone on the opposing team was better than my team. One of them was so petty they actually deleted me from their friends list on Pokemon Go. That's the kind of irrational hatred I'm talking about that comes with fame, and to this day I still don't know how to cope with it well. F. K. In the coffee. Let's talk about something completely different. A channel that's been around for almost two decades and never had a single copyright strike across over 9,000? Ha! I didn't realise that was the number until I looked it up videos would, you'd think, be in YouTube's good graces, but faced with declining subscriber numbers and a ridiculously huge drop in views per video, it set alarm bells ringing for the glorious algorithm. Around January 2017 was when I really started to notice the evergreen videos weren't necessarily evergreen. It seemed like my videos were steadily being cycled out of the algorithm's favour no matter how many hundreds of thousands or millions of views they had. The so-called adpocalypse happened around February 2017 from memory, but this was not the reason for the decline as to date I've had very few videos marked as not advertiser suitable. In fact, most of the ones I do have flagged as that are from Lethal Company VODs which were from 2023. Newer videos were largely ignored, the bulk of my subscribers were only interested in Overwatch and had since moved on or had simply just stopped using YouTube and those were now dead accounts. Overwatch in particular, which despite its controversies and so-called sequel, have still remained something that people play to this day and it is something you'd think would still get recommended from a channel with literally hundreds of videos about it, some of which are exceptionally popular, but no, they are forgotten and I mean that almost literally. Some friends and I did a little bit of an experiment. I asked them to see how hard it was to find an old Overwatch video of mine incognito so there would be no prior viewing history, and then to watch some, maybe even leave a comment afterwards. I tracked this via YouTube's analytic tracking backend app and found some rather strange results. One friend who works long night shifts said he watched my Overwatch highlights playlist and got through damn near 100 videos in a single shift. They're, they're like 10 minutes each. Of those videos he watched, a single view on one of them was tracked in the analytic backend. A friend who left a comment on three of my old Overwatch videos had the comments tracked correctly but no views registered. We did a similar experiment with my Twitch audience liking a, a VOD to the point where the average likes were way above the norm and its favour or lack of favour I guess in the algorithm remained completely unchanged. You can try these same tests for yourself if you like. What's to blame? Once out of the algorithm's good graces I feel like it's exceptionally hard for a channel to get back in and possibly impossible with older videos being the only popular ones. Leaving my NCN when it fell into administration may have done something strange to the older videos, but I don't know of any way to prove that. I did contact YouTube on two occasions over the years to look into my channel for any issues or discrepancies. On both occasions I was told that everything was working as intended. Looking back at those conversations I had with two different partner managers, I realise now that they never said my videos weren't being ignored by the algorithm, they simply said that everything was working as it should, which is not the same thing. This isn't an attempt to create some kind of crazy conspiracy, I doubt I'm the only old failing channel subjected to this, and YouTube is never going to explain how its algorithm fully works because if they did it would be exploited. Hell, people have already tried to exploit it, look at this. 
I keep getting scam emails with this kind of information where they have a browser extension installed to read the metadata of a video. All these people who contact me with this kind of thing always use an unregistered copy of Windows too. Huh. Let's make this clear again though. I'm still the largest source of blame for my channel's failure. I squandered my chance to really do well by not focusing on the one thing I did that was extremely popular and made the mistake of thinking I had the strength of character to carry on beyond that once interest in it faded. I do feel like the algorithm's whims have not helped, but at the end of the day it comes down to people being interested in the content you're making and how many people really want Let's Plays in 2024. Hell, there's full playthroughs or important cutscene highlights on YouTube the second an embargo lifts and it's impossible to compete with that unless you're also getting review copies yourself. I couldn't invent a new persona and forget the old one since the old one is the real me and the thought of playing a role instead of being genuine just doesn't sit right with me. The only thing for it was to branch out and I guess that brings us to the future. F. K. In. The coffee. The only thing to go right with my various experimentations with content in 2019 was opening myself up to help and advice. I don't like asking for help, which is a really, really stupid stance to have, by the way. I feel like I should succeed or fail on my own merits, but as I said, I was stupid for thinking that. From taking some help and advice, I started a second YouTube channel dedicated to board games and tabletop wargaming, called Flix Tabletop Gaming which is my other big hobby besides video games. It's been growing slowly over a few years and I'm enjoying it. While my Let's Play and former Evergreen videos gather dust on my main channel, despite my daily upload schedule of VODs from Twitch, I could be creative with painting up miniatures and showing them off to the world in battle reports or other styles of video. There is some crossover between the gaming and tabletop communities, obviously, since I'm an example of that, but the general attitude of both aren't quite the same. No one's threatened to kill me yet for a differing opinion on a board game anyway, but I'll keep you posted. The Tabletop channel usually gets about three new videos per week and I intend to keep up with at least that level of new content as long as I can, so please do check it out if you're interested. Besides that, we have the new format of videos for my main channel, the Dissection series, also known as Video Essays. I never really saw myself going the Video Essay route, despite my past writing opinion pieces for Critical Gamer. It just never occurred to me as something I could do. Despite the videos taking hours of work, for instance the Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League video took about 11 hours, not including having to play the damn game, which in this particular case I do consider work. or at least a chore. I've really enjoyed doing them and I hope to be able to do more. Along with long form critiques like this one and the ones I've already done, I hope to do smaller talking point videos like the one I've done so far on the point at which I stopped playing God of War Ragnarok. Will these changes and a second channel make a huge difference in the future? I hope so, but there's no way to be sure. Neither are likely to influence my Twitch stream, which is where I'll keep playing a variety of games, mostly with friends and hopefully in an entertaining way. Check that out too if you haven't. It's hard to take an optimistic view though, since it doesn't come naturally to me, but if nothing else, getting to be extra creative has been satisfying. Exploring new styles of content creation, even if they end up falling flat, has kept things interesting. Now then, I think it's about time to wrap things up. F. K. In. The. Coffee. Man, how did this end up being so damn long? I thought this would be one of the shorter ones. I guess egotistical content creators do like going on and on about themselves, right? I said I didn't want this to be a pity party though, so I hope I mostly kept that true and objectively laid out the lifespan of my channel and the mostly self-inflicted problems it's had. That was an accidental pun, by the way. One last point to close on though. You may have been thinking through all of this rambling, what's the big deal? As in, if I have to go get a different job, a real job, again, couldn't I still make videos and stream now and then? Why is there any issue? The only answer I can give to that is this. If you came from nothing, if you were being paid to do your dream job, a dream job where you tasted great success, you'd made new friends, you felt good, and you were forced to give it all up, could you honestly say that you'd still be as enthused to carry on doing it for nothing and to almost nobody? that you could remain happy putting on a show like that six days a week for the rest of your days? If you answered yes, then you are a better person than I am. You should give this content creation thing a try, you'll be better at it than me, everyone thinks it's very easy. 
Thank you for making it to the end of the video though. Uh, a lot of work does go into these videos, so please do consider showing your support if you'd like to see more of them in the future. Just pressing the like button or the subscribe button is a good start, but pressing the thanks button would be especially generous. My next project, depending on when you hear this, will probably be a look at the season one disaster for Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. Anyway, enjoy the rest of your day and ta-ta for now. Statement stricken from the record, please. Record? Is someone supposed to be writing this down?